Welcome friends. We are your hosts, Sandy and Wade, baby best friends turned husband and wife and business partners. This podcast is for the dreamers, the movers and shakers, and those who seek to attract their dream life. Strap in, getting magnetic in three, two, one. Like attracts like. If you see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. This moment in time, this is your time to rise. Hi, friends. We are so excited for today's show. We have the incredible privilege to hang out with the one and only Rita Davenport. And before we have her share, I want to share a little story with you guys. So if you've never heard of Rita Davenport, I want to be like, where have you been? (laughs) But I want to tell you this little story. So I was first exposed to Rita Davenport. Actually, she was a keynote speaker at a global training conference that we went to for our company. And I heard her speak and I heard her story and I became quite obsessed with her, honestly. And I thought, wow, she is a living legend. She has aged so gracefully. And I want to be like her at her age, like just truly so inspirational. And so Wade and I have become a magnet for anything that Rita puts out there. We've read her books. We've listened to many trainings that she's done. And I literally printed out a picture of her and I put it on my vision board, which is actually right here on the wall. I'm staring at Rita on my wall right now. And Wade has a picture of Rita on his vision board too, because we had a vision that we would get to know her personally one day. And it just so happens, right? When you get magnetic, when you put something out there, thoughts truly do become things. And so Wade was at dinner with his mother and his mother's friend. And he was mentioning how much we look up to Rita Davenport. And it just so happens that Wade's mom's friend personally knew Rita. And it it was like the stars aligned. And so (laughs) somehow Miriam, I believe, gave Rita Wade's phone number and this whole introduction happened. And When we got that phone call from Rita a few weeks ago, my jaw dropped to the floor. Rita called. It was an unknown number from, I think, Phoenix, Arizona. And Wade's like, should I answer this? I'm like, yes, answer. And Rita is like, this is Rita Davenport. This is not a solicitation call. (laughs) And I about lost it. It was truly a dream come true. And so today, we are so excited to have the one and only Rita on our podcast. And before we we ask Rita some questions, kind of just let her share share her light with the world. I want to brag on Rita for a bit because Rita Davenport, just in case you don't know everything she's done, she's a world-renowned speaker and author. She's in the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame. She's shared the stage with the likes of Tony Robbins, John Maxwell, Jack Canfield, Les Brown, Zig Ziglar, Og Mandino, Mel Robbins, Deepak Chopra, like all the legends, literally all of our, what we call digital mentors, people we listen to over and over. She's published, I believe, four books selling over a million copies, including our most recent one, which Sandy and I just read, Funny Side Up. Side note, would highly recommend that. It's she, hilarious. Can I just say, it's yes. the only book I've ever read where I actually was laughing out loud while During reading. the book, yes. I know. <laughs> um, I mean, beyond that, so speaker, author, she was the president of a top network marketing company, which... Right. Over 20 years, she took from $20 million, the company, to just under a billion dollar company. Like, that is incredible. Okay, let's keep going. She hosts their own television show where she got to interview the likes of Muhammad Ali, other amazing world changers. She was essentially, I'm pretty sure, the inspiration behind the Food Network, which is cool. Just side note. She's best friends with Dolly Parton. And actually, the song Jolene was written about her. Also, fun fact, she's bilingual. She speaks English and Southern. And (laughs) most importantly, she's just a genuine friend to everyone she gets to meet. I mean, we've only known Rita personally, or should I say, actually, Rita has only known us for a few (laughs) weeks now, but she's made us feel so special, like so important and like a true friend. And I truly believe that is Rita's superpower just from getting to know her from afar and up close. And so without further ado, we want to welcome international hope dealer and our new friend, Rita Davenport. Yay, um, welcome, Rita. Guys, I'm, I'm sending you a virtual hug. And, you know, we need three hugs a day just to keep them being weird. So if you're not getting them, <laughs> you're not giving them because you're only going to get in life what you give. So thank you for that <laughs> tremendous introduction. You just keep it up. Right now, my head's bigger than my butt. And that's pretty big, I might say. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. And I hope to 
make a difference. My whole life has been focused to making a difference, not just making a living. I could always make a living. I've worked since I was pretty much 12 years old. I've, I've had a job and sometimes more than two or three. But uh, right now, it's just living your life to say, why do you do this? Well, you know, God is watching. I want to give him a good show, first of all. And God is a man, by the way. I was in labor <laughs> with my first child for 28 hours. And no no woman would have done that to another woman. So I know God <laughs> I do. I do laugh about God created man first and then he created women just to correct his mistakes. <laughs> and my, my mama said, yeah, he did it like that because he didn't want a lot of suggestions. But I would have had a few. But it is so great for all of you watching right now. We, you know, with every adversity and with this COVID and all this going on in the world, there's a lot of adversity. But I've always lived my life with every adversity. There's an equal or greater gift. I want you to keep looking for the gifts because, first of all, I don't know about you, but I've learned more from failure than I've ever learned from success. I, I learned what not to do, which is really important. But all of us right now are challenged and uh, we're going to have the best come out of us if that's what we're looking for and we're expecting. And we're all in a reboot of our life right now and finding meaning to our life and making a difference, not to live your life, but just get by, but to make a difference, to say, you know, I ask myself before I go to bed at night, Three things. To, first of all, what did I learn today? And what did I do today to make a difference? And how can I be a better person tomorrow? What can I do? I journal before I go to bed and I love to look back at the journals and see what are you able to do? But each of us have, there's only six degrees of separation among all of us guys. And each of us have a powerful opportunity right now to make a, somebody's life better a lot by the example we set and finding good in everybody. When you come in contact with someone, I, I, I talked uh, years ago, a very large company, Mary Kay Ash was uh, a friend of mine, was on my TV show several times. And I, I spoke for the Mary Kay company and I taught everyone that everyone that you come in contact with has an invisible sign on them. And that sign says, make me feel important and that people work harder for praises than they do for raises. I mean, the amount of time when I have been in an administrative position that I would find something nice to say about somebody. And, and I'll be honest, sometimes you have to make it up. I mean, you have to, you know, and then <laughs> act as if, you know, well, they're doing this is so good. But looking at somebody, I, I, I was, uh, at, was at Kmart? And uh, well, that was a long time ago, but th there was a, a woman there that had on a bright colored shirt. And I said, oh, that is, that is so pretty. I love that. And she said, oh, she said, thank you for saying that. She said, I'm in chemotherapy and I don't feel good. And you say that made me feel good. So I realized that it was Walmart, by the way. I realized that no matter what, anytime we are out and about to total strangers, it sometimes challenges my family that I'm so talkative to everybody, but I love what is and I find good in everybody. Now, y'all got a question. I'll drink some water while you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Just everything you say. And it's interesting. Even you just saying, look at everyone as if they have a sign on them that says, like, I want to feel important. I've heard people say that before. And I didn't realize that was a Ritaism. And actually, I'm going to circle back with this in a bit because I want to hear some of the famous Ritaisms. I want our listeners to get to hear them. But my question is, hearing you say that you journal every night, just how you speak about things. I wonder, like, who are your biggest inspirations? Like, who are people that have played the biggest role in your life? Well, I studied a lot uh, Napoleon Hill. That you, you probably don't even know who Napoleon Hill is. You might. <laughs> of course, we do. Um, yeah, the Bible is the first thing, but uh, and 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 I'm not a Bible scholar. Uh, you know, I, I have spoken with Joyce Myers, but I I'm not that learned. But Napoleon Hill, just some of the people that, that I have studied uh, throughout my life, y'all know Mark Victor Hansen, you know Tom Hopkins, you talked about Deepak Chopra. When I spoke with Deepak Chopra, I teased him. I said, you know, if Oprah had married you, she'd be Oprah Chopra. So uh, he thought that was <laughs> too. He just thought that was. But Earl Nightingale, I actually had a chance to meet Earl Nightingale and have dinner with him, which was a, a wonderful event. And um, I just, you know, when you go back to it, Norman Vincent Peel. I, I don't know if, if you know The Power of Positive Thinking. And uh, he had written this book and the, the editors had turned it down. People turned it down and he put it in a trash can. And he told his wife, Ruth, he said, I'm not going to try to publish that book. But this is the power of positive thinking. Can you imagine? I'm not going to try to do publish this book. I won't be embarrassed anymore. 15 people turned him down. The only copy he had, he put it in a trash can. He said, 
do not take it out of that trash can. I'm embarrassed about this. So she didn't, being a dutiful wife, but she wrapped brown paper, a butcher paper, some kind of paper around the trash can, got on a subway, went to a publishing company in New York, took the book in and said, I can't take this out of the trash can, but you can. This book needs to be published. And that's how the power of positive thinking got published. That's the reason, guys, you need a team around you. You know, the people you spend time with, it's critical because one pessimist can pull 10 optimists down easier than 10 optimists can pull one pessimist up. And I hate to say this because I find good in everybody. Hurt people. When people hurt me or try to hurt me, I say to myself, you're not going to steal my joy. I got that from Joel Osteen. But I I hurt people are hurt people. They hurt you. They've been hurt. And I I think, and I pause, I wonder what hurt them to cause them to act out like this. So, you know, there's some people in your life, I hate to say it, but you have to bless and release. Maybe not physically, but mentally. You have to learn to say, cancel. When you hear negative say your thoughts around you, because they are, they're everywhere. And I learned the power of self-talk. I teach a whole lesson on self-talk. This is some of the the trainings that I've done. Because what you say to yourself has a huge impact on what happens. When I say, I am so stupid. Well, your mind hears that. Your mind says, okay, stupid, stupid, stupid. I had a chance to interview Muhammad Ali. He was a neighbor of mine. I lived about $3 $3 million down from his house, <laughs> a neighbor. And, but when I interviewed him in, in my broadcasting years, he said, Rita, I started out was just a poor black kid living in the ghettos of Louisville, Kentucky. Over and over again, I'd say to myself, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And he became the greatest boxer the world has ever seen because of his self-talk, what he said to himself. He said, I wasn't ex- exactly, but I told myself, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And look what happened with his self-talk. By the way, I have to tell you a funny story. My friend Margie was a flight attendant on a flight that Muhammad Ali was on after he had won the heavyweight championship second time. And everybody getting on the plane, because he was sitting in first class. I don't recommend first class because i never known of an airplane that backed into a mountain. Have you? <laughs> but anyway, so sitting in first class. People were going by and they were, oh, Muhammad Ali's on the plane. So they announced to buckle his seatbelt. Well, Muhammad Ali didn't buckle his seatbelt. And so my friend Margie went up and said, sir, we can't take off till you buckle your seatbelt. And he said, well, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she said, yes, sir, but Superman don't need no airplane either. So, he <laughs> so they could take off. But uh, Mohammed Lami, it was people like that, y'all, that, that I, I interviewed Milton Burrow one time. Some of you don't even remember Milton Burrow, but Milton Burrow at one time was a big name. And he told me on the air live show, he said, you're the best interviewer. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because in everybody's business, God gave us two ears and one mouth because we're supposed to listen twice as much. When you're working with any client or anybody and you're helping people, you're supposed to listen more than you talk. And he said, you are the best interviewer that I've ever been interviewed by. And I said, oh my gosh, because I was very, very young. I did not go to broadcasting school. I I had a BS degree from college, which I'm demonstrating right now. But anyway, I didn't go to some broadcasting school and I didn't always know. I thought when they gave me a signal like this, my blouse had come up and I didn't know that meant 30 seconds. You know, I was was doing it, but it was really, I had a huge viewership because they, I think challenged by this Southern accent, they were fascinated that I had teeth or something. I'm not sure. But anyway, (laughs) and so, I, when I said, I'm the best that ever interviewed you, I said, why do you say that? And he said, because you listen. He said, you ask the question and you listen to my answer and then you reflect on it like it means something and it makes me want to talk to you more. And I thought, that's the way life is, folks. You listen to people as they're talking and then you reflect and you you listen for what their needs are that you you know find a need and fill it. And you find out what, what are people looking for? I mean, whether it's the opportunity, a, a product or whatever it might be, people's needs have to be expressed. So anyway, I have been very blessed to have a loving, caring spirit. And I, I don't want to brag about this, folks, but you've got to love yourself and forgive yourself before you can ever love and forgive somebody else. So it starts with you. You got to decide, OK, what do I want? What you know, everybody listening right now, you got to ask yourself, what do you want? And and bad enough, you you got to have a burning desire. It's like you got to you got to want something as bad as you need air to breathe. Og Mandino, famous author, and he inspired me so much. I mean, I could list for hours the people that I've had uh, the blessing of being with. But Og Mandino tells a story in one of his books. He's the best selling author ever. That a man traveled all the way to India because there was some guru that had the secret of success. 
And he said he climbed a mountain and there was the guru sitting there in a robe and everything. And he said, sir, I come to you to find the secret of success. And he said, "Okay, follow me. And the guru goes down the mountain and there's a pond and he grabs this man by the back of his neck and sticks his head in the water and pulls it out. He said, now, when you want to succeed as bad as you wanted to breathe when your head was under the water, you will succeed. No, I have always, always live my life with the desire to succeed, mostly based on looking around, growing up in poverty in Tennessee, looking at family that my daddy could barely read and write a little bit. Mama was a little bit more. I think she got to about the eighth grade or something. But I looked at my family that I love so much and I thought, I've got to become successful to take care of these people because, I mean, bless their hearts. You know, you say anything in the South, you say, bless your heart. You, you know, it's OK. But I thought, bless their heart. I've got to make something out of my stuff. And I didn't feel like I really had that much going on to do that. So I had to work harder than maybe somebody that was really, really smart. But many people are just looking for a helping hand. And if you are, well, there is one. It's at the end of your sleeve. So the first thing about success is desire. And and another story that I I like to tell, and a lot of speakers tell it, is that you got to want to so bad that you you got to, as I talked uh, when I spoke years ago at a company, I told people to prepare for impact. And I got that from Captain Sully Sullenberg as he was landing on the Hudson when the, the geese had gotten into the engines and he was about to crash. And he said, it was flight 1549, he said to his crew and he said to all the passengers, he said, race for impact. And it was amazing how he had been able to land that plane on the Hudson. But let me tell you why. When I tell you to prepare for impact, did you know that he was a flight instructor about how to handle emergencies? Not many people know that. Did you know that he was a glider pilot? So all of his life before having that crash almost at the Hudson with the mechanical problems, he had prepared. So you got to want as bad as you want air to breathe. The second thing, you got to find what you want, what you're willing to give up to get it. Because I'm telling you, to be successful, I don't watch a lot of TVs and movies. And so decide what you're willing to give up to get. Because there are many things that I don't do. I mean, I realized a long time ago that I could pay someone, you know, as much as $50 an hour to clean my house so I could be writing a book or working on a speech or whatever, you know, getting ready for an infomercial, which I did the second infomercial ever. I mean, I found out there are things. So what am I willing to give up to get it? I always keep God first, as I said, my family is second and my career is third. But there are certain things that you kind of have to focus on what is necessary right now. Then the next thing is decide what you want to give and then set priorities. That is the most important thing. When I teach goal setting, a goal is just a predetermined idea directed toward a desired result. I mean, you've got a storyboard, you've got pictures, and those are goals. And when you set a goal, you leave your comfort zone. There are two principles of human action. We tend to gravitate to our comfort zone, and when we can't, we try to recreate it. So and that takes a whole 45 minutes to explain all that. But just know that goals are powerful, and goals must be written down. They must be within reach of your faith. If you didn't believe you could be at the top of an organization or if you didn't believe you could succeed and you weren't going to win that golf term or whatever it is, if you don't believe it, there is nothing I can say right now. I'm so sorry. I mean, I can do mouth to mouth to you and I can tell you, yes, you can, you can but you got to believe. I, I tease people because I ask people from time to time, how's business? I'll say that to somebody and they'll say, Oh, well, you know, with this COVID and this and that, I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Anytime anybody asks you from now on, how is business? You say, unbelievable. Now, you're not lying. It could be unbelievably good or unbelievably bad. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Practice saying that over and over. Again. Business is unbelievable. And your mind is going, oh, good. It's unbelievable. We're having a good time. So you set your priorities and you've got to write down those goals. And I would have goals in strategic places in my car, in the bathroom, in the kitchen. And by the way, the playlist ink is more powerful than the best memory. So write it down and look at it frequently. And it has to be a goal. It can't be just, I want to be happy. What makes you happy? What be specific about that goal? what it is that you are striving for. And your mind is like a magnet and you attract to you the things that you think about the most. So mind your mind because energy follows thought. What you think about, you bring about. So decide what you want, what you're willing to give up to get it, set your priorities. And then this is the home run I'm about to tell you right now. This is, I mean, all those other things are really important. 
but this is it. Go to work. Go to work. I can tolerate inability. I can tolerate just not being smart enough, whatever. I can't tolerate laziness. That's the one thing that I I won't give you a pass on that because any day above ground is a good day. If you're having a bad day, try missing a few and you'll see how good this one is. But the fact that you are alive and that you have your health, the number one priority of anybody this what right now listening to this is to be healthy. Let, let me tell you a great story. A dear friend of mine, Irma Bombeck, who was the number one author, she was the number one syndicated columnist in the world, by the way. She was a neighbor, uh, again, lived about $3 million down from her, but she was a, a mentor. And by the way, when I use the word mentor, every true mentor wants their mentees to outdo them. You know that? Every true mentor. I've been in situations where somebody I work with did better and I went, yay. So every true mentor wants their mentees to outdo them. So Irma was um, famous as an author and it was on the front page of the paper that Irma had just got a $14 million advance for her last book. Now, Irma, in my time management uh, program, I teach you how to say no. And Irma had learned how to say no because she really focused on her writing. She would say no to invitations and she would, she, I would ask her to be on my TV show. She's already, I'm working on deadline. I, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I said, oh, honey, I wouldn't have bothered you. When's your deadline? She said, six months. I said, six months? Have her I mean, I, I just, <laughs> bless your heart. Um, I said, six months, you can come on down and do the show today. She said, oh, no, I have to get ready, you know, get the makeup on. It takes all day. And I, this is the best time day of my life. And I forgave her. So I called her and said, Irma, what's it like? to get a $14 million advance on a book. I mean, that's a windfall, guys. I don't care how much money you have. She said, she kind of paused. She said, Rita, I'd really rather have a a kidney. You see, Irma was on dialysis. And I never, ever got past remembering. Anytime I complain about something, she would have given me a million dollars. Put your hand back here right now where your kidney's located and kind of pat it because you got a fifteen, a fourteen million dollar, fourteen million dollar kidney. Okay, now go over here on the other side. Put your hand. You got another one. <gasps> you got another fourteen million. You got twenty eight million dollars worth of kidneys, and you hadn't even thought about that. But somebody very wealthy would pay you. So you got a heart. You got lungs. You got how much are you worth, guys? So when I talk about health, is everything that is the top priority for all of us, and stay healthy. I mean, keep, you know, whatever you have, you know, I mean, there's so much information out now of what not to do and how to take care of yourself. But health is well. If you were worried about what, what is well, health is well. So just from listening today, you have gotten a, a $28 million benefit from this. So that's got to be worth something. As you mind your mind and let energy fall thought and what you think about, you bring about and say, cancel. You have a question. I know I'm stretching this out because we got decide what you want, what you're willing to get, get it. Set your priorities and go to work. Y'all go to work. Get your ask in gear. You have not because you ask not. You're never going to make a sale if you don't open your mouth. Every time you open your mouth, money goes in or out by what you say. And what are you saying? Are you afraid? Nobody's too high up for you to talk to and nobody's too low for you to talk to. Everybody in the world is open for you to talk to about your business. And you've got to make sure that you look at them with appreciation. Gratitude and appreciation are powerful elements of anybody's business. Uh, William James, the father of psychology, which he's written many books, and I have books in my office from William James. One is Man Can Alter His Life by Altering His Attitude. Ooh, Man Can Alter His Life by Altering His Attitude. And I turned that in on my last book, The Funny Side Up Book, and they couldn't prove he said it. So guess what? I read it down before it said it. So we can't prove that William James did. But William James was working on his last book. He was in poor health, and he had an assistant that brought him a pot of flowers, a get well pot of flowers. And he was writing this neighbor a note, thanking the neighbor for the pot of flowers. And William James said, oh my God, I just realized what we all want in life. We want appreciation and gratitude. And so folks, that's what I'm talking about. Let people know. I call three people every day during this pandemic. I call three people. I call somebody I was in the first grade with at school. I call people as famous. Oh my gosh, Tom Barrett. I called him the other day. And it, you, you, see, you would be amazed at some of the people that I call. I won't, won't worry you out with all that now. But I, I call people and tell them 
how much I appreciate them and how grateful I am that they have been in my life. And often what I, I learn from them and just all the things, do you know how good it makes people feel to get that kind of feedback? So in, in today's world, especially be expressive of gratitude. Be so appreciate. Appreciation is just powerful because sometimes, you know, and, and by the way, we talk about giving. Always skip the maids. A couple of things I don't want to forget to tell you. Always skip the maid uh, and always skip anybody that's serving food because except for the grace of God, you'd be serving that instead of eating it. So always do that. And then always, never, ever, ever not make your bed every day. Now, I know I sound like a nagging mom or a wife right now to say something like that, but I mean, in the military, you have to make your bed. And that's a great example. I have a friend that's a three-star general and uh, admiral, three-star admiral. And he talked about the importance of making your bed. It's something that you've gotten something accomplished, at least. If you don't get much else done, you've got your bed made up. And there's kind of gives you a, a swagger, a kick in your giddy up to know you got your bed made up. So these are just some of the things that you do in order to be successful. And what is success? Living your life the way you choose and knowing when to let go of things that aren't working anymore. You can't be lazy. You know, I mean, you might get away for a while, but being lazy is something I will not tolerate because you got all to work with. Remember, you got those kidneys, $28 million worth of kidneys. You got those to work with. You guys have any questions? I'm talking too much. I'm not being, I'm not being gracious. You are amazing. No, every word you're saying, I'm soaking up into Jeez. every pore of my being. I'm just. Loving every second. Stoking in words of wisdom. And I think a few things. Sandy and I make our bed every day as a part of every day. So we love that, right? It's the first win of the day. You Whether you have a good day or a bad day, you come home to a made bed. But I just realized I've only gotten one hug today. So I need at least two more to stay away from being well, weird. Give me one right now. Here. We got one live on, on this yeah. podcast. And we're giving you one virtually. We're giving you a virtual right hug. Thank you so but much. Yeah. Also, I think... I just noticing, you know, we, we, for the listeners out there, Sandy and I get to interview Rita on Zoom, on video. And I really believe your gift makes room for you, right? And Rita does not need to be doing this podcast. She doesn't even need to be doing engagement speaking or anything. But you can tell just how energetic and by the way she shares that this is her gift and you're walking in your gift. And I think that is so special. And I know, you know, you, you were born Rita Davenport, but you weren't born this successful person. And I know that's, you know, there's probably a long story to your background, but I think it's so empowering, like yeah. your upbringing and you've touched on this principles of success and how to become successful, but you weren't always the Rita Davenport, right? No, I, I was raised in poverty, which was my gift. I was ashamed of being impoverished. I was ashamed I didn't have inside plumbing. We used to bathe in a number two wash tub. And I didn't want anybody at school to see where I lived because I was kind of popular at school. I was in student government and cheerleading and all that. But I was ashamed. And at, with every adversity, there's the equal or greater gift we talked about. But every successful person at some time in their life is felt subjected to prejudice or they felt inferior. And I felt inferior growing up because I did not have a lot of money. I also had a speech impediment. So in the first grade, they were going to put me into special education. And these were children that were down in the, the basement. They, they were not mainstreamed. And my mother, when I was six years old, took my brother and me to California to help take care of her sister that was critically ill with cancer. Enrolled me in the first grade. And I was, grew up in Tennessee, uh, in Flat Rock, Tennessee. I had a speech impediment. My aunt had made me some dresses out of Feed sex. And I was so proud of those dresses. I'd go around to everybody, look at my new dress. It's made out of feed sacks because I couldn't say feed sack. So my nickname is still feed sack. But the point, I was proud of having that new dress, even though it was made out of flower sacks. So see, be grateful for what you've got. Be proud of where you, where you are right now and grateful for what you got because that attracts more. So we go to California and they test me for placement in, in school. They call mama. Mama said, I think I know what you're going to say if you tested my daughter. And they said, oh, really? Well, we found out that she's gifted and we want to move her from the first grade to the third grade. Now, I don't know what that says about the California school system compared to Tennessee, <laughs> but I went from being handicapped in Tennessee with learning disabilities to being gifted in California. So next thing I know, I go back to my school uh, about three months later and Miss Tyler, my teacher, I kept up with my teacher. Teachers are so precious. Until she was in her 90s, I would send a birthday flowers every year to Miss Tyler, my first teacher. And I said, Miss Tyler, guess what? 
I'm gifted. I'll help you with the slow kids. And she said, Rita, you would. She said, you really believed it. You'd put their sweaters on, you'd line their papers and pencils up, and you'd help me with all the students. And so the idea that I was raised in poverty was my gift. And when I interviewed Dolly Parton on my show, I've interviewed her a couple of times. Funny, I have to tell you a funny story. First time I interviewed her, she played The Coat of Many Colors. And when she grabbed that guitar, I had never noticed why a guitar was cut out till I saw her grab one. And I said, Dolly, I never know. She said, well, you just say anything, do you? I said, that's exactly right. But Dolly Parton said her gift, her greatest gift was growing up in poverty too. So I go to a concert. I get a call from her agent to come to a concert about four years ago in Phoenix. My daughter-in-law went. My husband had something he couldn't go. So we were invited backstage, Dolly Parton backstage. Go backstage and she calls all the crew. Everybody come over here. Come over. This is important. And everybody stands around. There's my daughter-in-law who's beautiful red hair. She's standing there and I'm standing. She said, y'all have always wanted to know who the real Jolene is. Well, it's actually right here. This is the green-eyed Jolene. And everybody starts cheering. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, <laughs> I, just look at me. I don't look anything like what you would think she'd be jealous of. But anyway, we go out and it was about 2,000 people in the concert. And she had front row seats. And she said, OK, all you in Phoenix, because y'all know broadcasting, because I had a show there for 14, for 15 years. And yes, it was my idea to do the Food Network. Uh, the Meredith Corporation owned Better Homes and Gardens. They turned it down. But local ABC general manager started the Food Network with my idea. She said, are you always wondered who the real Jolene is? Well, she's right here. It's Rita Davenport. So, y'all, I didn't make this up. I couldn't make up such an great <laughs> story. But I did date Carl Dean, Dolly Parton's husband. Uh, I'd known him since the fourth grade. And we dated. He was voted wittiest in our senior class. So you see what we had in common. His <laughs> Carl Dean was amazing. And he gave my mama one time. Carl smoked and my mama smoked. And, and that was a problem for me. Because uh, see, smoking causes you not to be able to see or hear. That's the only reason that smokers have not seen or read the Sturgeon General's report. It's been out now since about 1949. <laughs> so he gave my mama $2. And he said, I never want you to be broke. I'm going to give you this $2. And I buried my mother with that $2 bill that Carl Dean had given her. So Jolene. Jolene, now you now you can really respect that. You got to look at me closely. You, nobody ever looks at the green eyes. They look down at my chest and they go, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I've got a lot of good stories about that. I, I, I will wear you out. Anyway, I won't do that now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that for my stand-up program. <laughs> so good. I want to ask you a, a question. I know you've been married to David, I believe, for over 50, over 54 50 years now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 54. Wow, 54. So can you give a young couple like us or for any of our audience listening in, we've been married Coming almost two years, two. but you don't know our story, Rita. We've known each other since we were babies. I know. I, I saw okay. that. Well, we dated six years. It took me six years to close him. And <laughs> uh, it took 12 years for us to have a baby. Oh, I got so many good stories. But uh, I said to him one time, but by the way, I, I cried the first six weeks of my marriage, y'all. I was in Florida. He's in the space program. He's an engineer at Put a Man on the Moon. We had moved. I graduated from college, got married just, in just a few days, moved to Florida. I didn't go to college for two years. So he was ahead of me two years. And I didn't know anybody. And I was crying and homesick. Didn't have a job yet because he was going to be transferred to Houston. And I hadn't applied for a job. And I was putting a letter in the mailbox in the at, at the apartment complex. And the mailman was there getting all the mail. And he said, little lady, you don't look happy. And I said, I'm not happy. My husband doesn't make me happy. And he said, ma'am, I don't know you. He said, but you're going to be about as happy as you make up your mind to be. You know, OMG. Oh, <laughs> I couldn't but changed my life. All of a sudden, I was knocking on apartment doors, meeting people, having a uh, the happy hour at my house, you know, socially, I was having them the because I realized that he can make me miserable, but he's not going to make me happy. I mean, I'm going to be about as happy as I make up my mind to be. A postman told me that. I mean, I had taken all these psychology courses and everything, and he told me that changed my life. So I think another secret of our marriage is that I'm on the road a lot. I'm going to be honest with you about that. I can't make <laughs> this up. So, it, I mean, because right now this COVID I'm telling you, it's challenging to spend this much time. Yeah, you probably edit this out, but I called my doctor the other day. I said, I think we need to get a prescription of Ambien and Viagra. And I said, we both have a good time every night. And, uh, <laughs> and look, 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 wait. Uh, yeah, you, you, have to swallow, you have to swallow it quickly. You get a stiff neck. But anyway, <laughs> I know you're going to edit all this out, but it's funny oh. because you got to have a sense of humor. That's the reason our marriage has lasted. I've had a sense of humor. I, I asked him, what, what about me? Phil turned him on after all these years. You know, he paused and thought about it a long time. He said, you're so clean. 
you're always taking those bubble baths and everything. I said, clean. I didn't. I thought, well, that. <laughs> I went out the next day and I bought myself a hundred and fifty dollar Vanity Fair pinois and negligee black. I walked out in the bedroom that night and I twirled around like Loretta <laughs> Young used to. Y'all don't know who that is, but back in the day, Loretta Young. And he said, well, now this is a black. You got to get black. You know, Pinwa and Negaje. He said, Well, any friend of Zorro's is a friend of mine. <laughs> you gotta have a sense of humor. Hey, I got some I got much more than that. But anyway. didn't he say didn't he say one time like, I feel like I've only been married to you five minutes, five minutes underwater. Yeah. <laughs> You really have been listening. It's just gone like five minutes, five minutes underwater. Oh, you do listen. Ooh, you pay attention. That's good. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Okay. Can you end us with some of your, we want to hear some like rita Some like, of your some... favorite, most famous. There's so many. But when I got paid a lot of money for this quote, and it was a full page in USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and, and a, a company Actually, they did it twice. Uh, money's not everything, but it's right up there with oxygen. Money is not important unless you don't have any. It's kind of like sex, you know. It's not important <laughs> to have anything. Money is not everything, but it's right up there with oxygen. And Les Brown gives me credit every time he uses that, which is so so kind. And another one, don't don't hang around people that are more messed up than you. I'm I'm looking at reading as uh, don't don't take yourself seriously, y'all. Don't take yourself seriously because you're gonna mess up from time to time. I know I have, but take what you do seriously. Yeah, you know, God didn't make any jump. When I mess up, I say, Okay, God, you didn't make any jump. One of the most important, I did have some notes. We're in the people business. I don't care what business you're in, you're in the people business. Never forget this. And everything you're doing is the numbers game. And like I said, keep your ass in gear. You have not if you ask not. If you help enough people get what they want, then you're going to always get what you want. And it was always important to me. I looked at a business that I was in years ago, and it was like my social work opportunity. I was a social worker right out of college, and I found out welfare didn't work. But this business that I was in was a level playing field, and you could help people grow because it was a personal development business disguised as a product company, but it was really a personal development business. And so you're not in this business for yourself or by yourself, but to help other people. Do a little bit more than is expected of you, just a little bit more, even 10% more, and then give yourself a mental enema from time to time. You're going to have negativity. Go over to the commode and talk to it. And when you describe what you just went through, flush it and that's gone. Don't 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 allow yourself to keep thinking about with stinking thinking, as my friend Zig Ziglar used to say. And know that right now, right now, you're at the right place at the right time with the right product and the right opportunity to have more, to be more, to learn more, to earn more. So you can ultimately share more. And it's all about the sharing, y'all. You know, oh, it just feels so good to give something to somebody, especially when they don't expect it. And they're so surprised. And oh, anyway, I'll get into that. Um, Okay, let's see what else. Oh, put your big girl panties on and deal with it. That was one that I really got a lot of attention on because we got to put our big girl panties on. We have negativity. And you've got people that you're working with and they can be negative and just smile and messes with them. When you smile and they're so negative and you keep saying good things to them, they just don't know how to fight back. So uh, let's see. The secret of happiness is good health and a short memory. And that short memory is after you do the mental enema that I talked about. That's it. <laughs> and then it act as if, act as if you're at the top of your game. And, act, you know, just act as if. How would you act if you were at the top? And don't ever let anybody tell you not to get above your raisin. I was told growing up, don't get to try to get above your raisin. Ain't nobody in this family ever graduated from high school. Nobody's ever had inside plumbing. What makes you think you're going to do that? And I knew I was going to do it. And that was the reason. And oh, let's see, I've got some funny things here. Uh, give gifts, recognition gifts, be generous with people. I did, hadn't taken chemistry and all the preparatory classes. So I had a high school counselor told me not to go to college. She said, you're not college material. I didn't go to college for two years. And then I decided I wanted to marry my husband, David, and he was going to Vanderbilt. If he outgrows me, I'll be an old broken down cow. And he'll say, come on, Nelly, and I'll be dragging him down because he's going to be successful. So I decided working two and three jobs. I invested in, in college, went to college, graduated in three years with honors. I received wow. a BS degree. And um, I, I know I've been demonstrating that for about an hour. But anyway, I, <laughs> I did. And so people have asked me, you know, what made you feel like you could do it? Okay, when I was in bacteriology and biology, I, I studied about how we all got started. This is my closing because this is all about magnetism. Okay, we all got started the same. 
Exactly. As little tiny sperm. And in order for you to be born, if your father only had an average sperm count, you had to outswim probably 400 million other sperm. Now, I I don't know what motive. And by the way, this was uphill. By the way, this is uphill. (laughs) So how many of you listening right now can't swim? Raise your hand. Okay, because you did once. And when somebody can't tells you you can't do something, in order to be born, I had to outswim over 400 million other sperm. That was tough. This is easy. By the way, (laughs) it's not the first sperm that gets to the egg. Now, Sandy, you appreciate this. I I had a a doctor come to me after a speech when I told the sperm story. I said, so when somebody tells you you can't do something, say, you don't know what I did before. I swam over 400 million sperm to get here. So I had a burning desire. I had purpose. I was active. I swam faster, whatever. And this doctor, and I love doctors. You know the difference between God and a surgeon? God doesn't think he's a surgeon. Y'all going to love that lady when you think about it. Anyway, so who's speaking? This doctor came up to me and he said, read that story about the sperm. It's not the first sperm that gets there. He said, Rita, the sperm circles the egg and the egg turns and the egg selects the sperm it wants. So this would be best for you and best the, the women, the mother, the girl gets to pick the sperm. So I love that part of the story. So you're the lucky sperm. No, you're the one selected. So and when anybody tells you, I mean, that stops people in their tracks to say, are you kidding me? Say, yeah, I swim. And then they, they won't contest you and anything else. Thank you for having me here. I always teach you to say, love you. In every text, every email, every time I talk to somebody, you have no idea how many speeches I've gotten because the owner of a company is calling me and I'm saying, love you. When I hang up, they'll well, book her. So anyway, I just appreciate it. And by the way, I do have a website, www.readadavenport.com. Yes. I love you all, though, and I thank you for having me. Man, i got lots more material. Let's do this again. Wow. Thank you so much, Rita. That was truly incredible, so inspiring. And for anyone who wants to connect with Rita, Check out her website, RitaDavenport.com. She is still, to this day, doing trainings, doing speeches, doing everything in between. She's got amazing books you can check out on her website. But Okay, I want to know, what was your favorite part? Like, everything about that was just so magical. I'm like, I literally feel just excitement, like, running through my veins. I cannot believe that that just happened. Like, think about how this all conspired over the past three weeks and just how we had her on our vision board and how we got connected to her and now how she was our first guest on our podcast. Like, how did that all just happen? Truly amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a testament to getting magnetic, right? It's a testament to we both had Rita on her vision board separately. We both saw her at our global training conference for a company in 2019 and said, that's someone we need as a mentor. We then, you know, listened to all of her stuff, read her books and essentially attracted her into our life. I think my favorite part, the whole thing was so amazing. My favorite part was being on video and seeing her enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to do this for us. You know, she's a world renowned speaker, Um, but, you know, we got to know her and she was like, heck yeah, I'm doing it. I cannot wait to do it. And just seeing her being so enthused and like I said, like walking in her purpose was my favorite part. It was like she said, she could have kept going for hours and we're excited to have her on as a as a future guest too, to part part two. Mm, So good. So many good nuggets in her story, too. I just feel like it's so relatable. So real, so raw, so authentic. It's amazing to see how she came from really like she didn't have, you know, an abundant childhood and what she's really made for herself. And I love her. You need three hugs a day not to not be weird. So true. That's let's just adopt a good lesson. That. I'm adopting that. I also love that she calls three people a day. I think amazing. that's amazing. Like, wow. Rita, that's incredible. Hats off to you. I think my I think my biggest takeaway is she is someone who has an extraordinary level of success. But deep down, she just makes you feel special. Mm -hmm. She makes us all listening feel important. And like she said, like everyone has a sign that make me feel important. I think that is a key to life, right? I think when you can make other people feel special, you become magnetic. People want to be around you. So true. Mm, We love you, Rita. Love you, Rita. That's a wrap for today. Excited for the next episode on our miracle morning routine. Mm-hmm, which is great. She actually touched on a couple things that we already do. Yes. And don't forget, if you got value out of this episode, I mean, gosh, how can you not with Rita? Share this with someone. Share this with someone who needs to hear it. We would also so appreciate if you subscribe to the podcast, if you rate it, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, review it. 
We'd love to see that. We'd love to share with you guys. And don't forget, you can connect with us on Instagram. Sandy is at SandyClaws7. I am at Wellness with Wade. And our podcast is at Getting Magnetic. So with that said, have an epic rest of your day. Only those that can see the invisible can do the impossible. So remember, you are magnetic.